In this lecture, we will discuss chronic renal disease. Kidneys are an important part of the renal system. As we can see in this figure, we have two kidneys. The one on the left is slightly higher compared to the one on the right. And the two kidneys are connected to the urinary bladder by the ureter. The urine forms in the kidneys and it then is sent, <clears throat> is sent to the urinary bladder for temporary storage. Eventually, it is disposed out of our body through the urethra. If we look at the structure of the kidneys, we can see that this is an organ with different parts of the soft tissue. For example, we have the renal cortex closer to the surface of the kidney with higher density tissue. Then we have the renal medulla, which is definitely less dense, and then the renal pyramid. All of these radiate out from the center, and the center is where we find this hollow space called the renal pelvis. So this collects the urine your kidney is making, and then eventually it travels down through the ureter into the bladder, and then down through the urethra to be excreted. About 20 million Americans have different kinds of kidney disease. So this is obviously a really large number. The treatments for chronic kidney disease are among the most expensive of disease management. The reason for this is that with the development of technology, for example, hemodialysis, and of course, advancements in medication, people with CKD can survive for decades. But these decades of survival are accommodated by compromised quality of life. And as we'll see, chronic kidney disease is a progressive, irreversible chronic disease. So a patient cannot really recover from it. We can manage the condition, but this management requires constant care. And that can take a toll on the patient, their family, as well as society and the healthcare system. Primary causes of CKD are hypertension and diabetes. As the prevalence of hypertension and diabetes increases, so does the prevalence of kidney disease. So if we think about it, obviously the hypertension and the diabetes are the upstream events in relation to chronic kidney disease. But what about the events that is even further upstream from hypertension and diabetes? Well, we know that about two thirds of adults in the United States are either overweight or obese. And we know obesity is a risk factor for both hypertension and diabetes. So we can see the chain of events in this case, that when someone becomes obese, and then if the obesity is not managed properly, over time, the patient may develop hypertension and or type two diabetes. And this is the same thing uh, with long-term and usually poor management of chronic diseases. Eventually, they will hurt the kidney and reach chronic kidney disease. So we're talking about, again, decades-long development from one condition to the next. So treating CKD is important, but we would be treating the downstream event. So if we really want to prevent this cascade of events, we should focus on obesity and the complications of obesity. In physiology and anatomy classes, we learned that the basic functional unit of the kidneys is called a nephron. So this figure here shows the anatomy of a nephron. And we can see in this unit, there's this ball of tiny arteries here. And we call this ball the glomerulus. And outside of the glomerulus, we find a capsule called the Bowman's capsule. So that's surrounding 
that ball there. And here we need to be very clear that we have the small artery called the um, afferent arterioli leading the arterial blood into the glomerulus, this tiny ball of the arteries, and then the blood flows out in the efferent arterioli. So the afferent arterioli is definitely an artery by nature. It is not a vein. So remember and be clear about this. Also, if we recall what we learned in physiology, the pressure in the arteries is much higher than in the veins. This is why if someone's artery is damaged or even punctured or, punctured or cut, then we may see blood coming out like a fountain spraying out because of the high pressure. So do know that for things um, to be filtered out of the glomerulus, we rely on this pressure. Blood flows into the Bauman's capsule, then, then through this uh, microtubule, and the structures of the glomerulus sustains that high pressure. In a sense, this ultrafiltration process is very similar to when we wrap something in a piece of cheesecloth and then apply pressure, and we see that the liquid, what's dissolved in the liquid, will flow through the cheesecloth, but the large pieces then stay behind. So that's kind of the same concept that's going on here. So what is filtered out? Obviously water and small water soluble molecules such as glucose, electrolytes, small amino acids, and urea. These can be filtered out. As far as the concentration of these substances are concerned, the concentration in the blood and the concentrate in this filtrate and the Bowman's capsule are almost identical. There's uh, really little difference. But large water soluble molecules, for example, aminoglobulins, albumin, and those other big proteins, they cannot be filtered out of the glomerulus. If the glomerulus is functioning properly and the membrane does its job, it will allow the smaller molecules to go through, but stop the larger ones. You know, things like white and red blood cells, they should not go through this filtration process. If they do, then something is wrong with the glomerulus. And this is why we check urine tests to see if there are blood cells. So to check if they are positive for red or white blood cells. Because if they are positive, this would indicate that the kidney or somewhere in the urinary system, that there is a problem. So after the filtrate enters the glomerulus, it will flow out in these convoluted tubules. Um, so goes through these tubules, through the loop of Henle, and uh, this U-shape and then comes up and continues to move through. And this long path of flowing increases surface area for this web of small veins. So we see the convoluted tubule is totally um, covered by these little purplish small veins. And this web surrounding the tubes um, allows us to reabsorb things that um, we need to reabsorb. For example, although glucose can be filtered out, we want to reabsorb everything because we don't really want glucose to show up, show up in the urine, right? So over this process, when the filter flows through this convoluted tubule, a lot of useful things are reabsorbed. And of course, after being reabsorbed, eventually everything goes back into the vein, then back to the blood circulation. And we do have certain things that are not reabsorbed and will eventually be disposed of in the urine. So it goes, that will make it to the collecting duct that goes down to the renal pelvis and then eventually through the ureter to the bladder, the urinary bladder uh, for storage, temporary storage. So this is how we get rid of certain metabolic wastes. For example, 
uh, carbon dioxide, among other things. Also, part of this is contributing to the buffer system to help keep our internal pH value within that relatively constant range. So this slide just explains what we just talked about, the um, going over the structure and the function of the glomerulus and the nephron. In terms of the function of the kidneys, uh, making urine is definitely the best known. So also what's in the urine, so just the process of urination itself, itself helps our body to regulate its fluid balance. And as I just mentioned, there's also the excretion of metabolic waste. It also functions for electrolyte balance and acid-base balance. Our urine has some molecules that contain phosphate. Different types of phosphate groups uh, with different protons attached to it, which allows the change in the urine pH to buffer the dramatic change in the blood pH, which we would not want. Also very important, uh, we have several hormones that are secreted by the kidney that can regulate the hemodynamics. For example, we'll, when we talk about hypertension, we mentioned a system called the renin-angiotensin system. This system is the first, um, in the first, the first molecule mentioned in this system is renin and it is secreted by the kidney. And we know that the system will activate, when it's activated, it will cause the sodium in fluid retention, which increases blood volume, which in turn increases peripheral resistance, and that increases blood pressure. So really, the kidney has an important endocrine functions as well because renin is considered a hormone. Also, there are other hormones secreted by the kidney, for example, EPO, and that's the one that stimulates the red bone marrow to make red blood cells. And we'll talk about more about this when we're um, discussing uh, kidney disease comorbidities. Also, though not directly generated in the kidneys, the final uh, activation of vitamin D is done in the kidneys. Once activated, it becomes calcitriol. Therefore, our bone health also relies on normal kidney functions because that's where the uh, active form of vitamin D is released into the system. To test kidney function, uh, we do have many, many different tests. Uh, some are urine tests, as we mentioned before. We check to see if there are red blood cells or white blood cells or any albumin in the urine. And as we mentioned, uh, we should not see any of these present under normal conditions. But if they do show up in the urine, that means that likely something is wrong in the nephron uh, with the glomerulus where filtration is occurring. So those are the things that shouldn't show up, but once they do show up in the filtrate, our body does not have a mechanism to reabsorb them as we do for smaller, smaller molecules such as glucose. Also, we are able to calculate, and I emphasize calculate, the GFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate. This rate reflects on how fast the substances are cleared from the plasma. So uh, later on, we'll see what the actual formula is to calculate GFR. And this marker is also used to diagnose which of the five stages a chronic kidney disease patient is currently at. And that diagnosis will then determine what kind of treatment the patient will require. This clearance uh, calculation requires information including the patient's age, ethnicity, and gender, and we'll see that later on in more detail. We also have other tests that can specifically test tubular functions. Also, we can check, uh, look at the urine under a microscope and check for cells or see if there's any sort of infection going on. We also do have uh, ways to do medical imaging for evaluation of the kidney function or anatomy. 
For example, we can do an MRI, ultrasound, or we can use um, dye tests. So we know that literally the ultrafiltrate contains all of the smaller water soluble contents in the blood. So if we inject a dye into the blood, eventually the dye will show up in the kidney. And then if at that point we do an x-ray, we'll be able to see the shape of the kidney, especially the renal pelvis, which we mentioned earlier. So that can actually give us some idea if the structure that we mentioned, um, you know, if these structures are normal, the renal cortex, medulla, and the pyramid. Um, and, you know, they may not look normal if, for example, there's cancer or a parasite, or even in certain cases, we can have polycystic kidney, just as we've seen polycystic ovarian syndrome. So all of these could be possible. And similar to the liver, we can also do a biopsy of the kidneys. Of course, this is more invasive and the indication is strictly controlled. Knowing all of the major functions of the kidneys um, and what they carry out, we can understand that why, if we have chronic kidney disease, so many, many things can go wrong. We will have fluid retention, which will give us edema. And that is also contributed to by low albumin level, because in this case, we may lose a lot of albumin through the urine. And the result is we don't have enough left in the bloodstream. When the fluid and sodium retention, um, so with those things, among other reasons, we will have hypertension. So in this case, the hypertension might be secondary. So it's not primary hypertension, but it's the, the, con excuse me, the consequence of compromised kidney function. As we mentioned earlier, we do have kidneys to buffer the dramatic change in blood pH value. The kidney through urine can dispose of actual protons. Therefore, if we cannot get rid of these effectively, it will result in metabolic acidosis. So too many protons are being generated and we cannot dispose of them as normal. And due to decreased excretion, we will also have retention of uh, potassium in the system, which is called hyperkalemia. And this is a very severe condition because too much potassium in the blood could lead to cardiac arrest, so this could be fatal. This is why, as we will see later on, potassium is one of the minerals we need to watch and monitor when we design a diet or calculate daily requirements for renal patients. Many patients also have microcytic anemia and iron deficiency. And we know that microcytic anemia is the feature for anemia caused by iron deficiency. However, in this case for CKD patients, the reason behind this type of anemia lies even more upstream than just iron intake or iron status because of that EPO hormone, erythropoietin. So the EPO hormone that stimulates red um, bone marrow to synthesize red blood cells is secreted by the kidney, as we mentioned before. Therefore, CKD patients, when they have anemia, the reason more often than not is because the hormone is not released adequately. So the bone marrow is never fully activated to make enough red blood cells. And you may see this diagnosed in the chart as anemia of chronic disease. Also associated with decreased excretion, we will see an accumulation of nitrogenous waste in the blood, and we will have secondary hyperparathyroidism. And this is something that can lead to renal bone disease. So you may remember this figure from advanced nutrition. So under normal conditions, 
um, when the blood calcium level is low, it will stimulate the secretion of the parathyroid hormone. And once PTH is released into the bloodstream, it can have effects on several target tissues. So one, it will mobilize the bone to release more calcium, right? So this will help elevate blood calcium levels. And of course, this free calcium ion is done at the expense of the bone density. And we can imagine if we constantly have a high pH level, this person's bone density would suffer. Another target for PTH is our kidney. So high PTH can increase the resorption of calcium ions in the kidney. So we'll lose less calcium in urination. This would allow us to conserve more calcium to help raise the blood calcium level. And another thing PTH does to the kidneys just is to stimulate the final activation of vitamin D. After this activation, vitamin D becomes fully activated and it is called calcitriol or 125-dehydroxyvitamin D3. And calcitriol will stimulate the absorption of the calcium through the intestine. So eventually, this will get absorbed into the bloodstream and then pay back the, um, what was borrowed from the bone so that our bone mass doesn't suffer. So this is the normal feedback regulation in response to low blood calcium level. Again, remember this is the normal uh, process here. But in CKD patients, we still have normal stimulus. For example, we have um, you know, low blood calcium And the initial response to that low blood calcium is also normal. So we see the increase in the PTH secretion. But if we recall the three targets of PTH we mentioned in the previous figure, two of them are in the kidneys. So one of them is the renal absorption of um, calcium. So we don't have that because right now the kidney is compromised. So, and it's not because we don't have enough PTH, that's fine, but the kidney com being compromised affects that. It also affects the ac um, activation for calcitriol. So this is also compromised because of decreased renal function. So if we look at this, that means we cannot preserve more calcium from the urination and we can't stimulate the intestine to absorb more calcium because we don't have enough calcitriol. So there's only one active response here, and that's you know, for the PTH to do to increase blood calcium level, and this would be to keep dissolving bone mineral. Therefore, we will have a lot of bone turnover. Eventually, because of this, things aren't being caught up and we will have secondary hypothyroidism and um, as well as uh, long-term consequences and leading to uh, renal bone disease. So that's why for dialysis patients, um, many of them, if we check their medications, they will often have prescribed to them an active form of vitamin D and a calcium supplement to mitigate this condition through feedback regulation. And this is so that we can manage the renal bone disease through an indirect manner.